everyone, Ethan here. Today I'm going to talk about uniparental dyspnea. But before I talk about the concept, I want to talk about, talk about the word. When I was in lecture and I heard this word, I remember being struck by a sense that, wow, this sounds like a very smart sounding word. I remember being completely distracted from my horrifically drawn notes and just being taken aback and daydreaming about how, wow, this word sounds like something scientists would say. And by transitive property of equality, because I'm learning about it, I myself am becoming a scientist. I had already watched, you know, one or two hours of lecture at this point. My brain was fried, and this was just, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. And I was in, you know, daydreaming land. And when I came to several minutes later, I realized I had missed the entire section on beauty parental dice. I mean, I had to rewind and really sort of dig in and figure out what the heck was going on. Because of that moment, because I had to sort of dig in and figure out what the heck was going on, which happens a lot on a day-to-day basis, I figured, well, let's give a video. Let's make a video on this topic. So with that out of the way, before we actually talk about this idea of any parental dice, I, mean, I want to talk about basic Mendelian genetics, because it helps sort of compare and contrast that when we talk about uniparental parental dice. In basic Mendelian genetic patterns of inheritance, you each offspring inherits one allele from each parent for each specific gene in question, right? That's why the Punnett square exists. And the reason why this happens is meiosis. Each meiotic division, the two successive divisions that occur in meiosis creates these haploid gametes. And in fertilization, you have two haploid gametes, one from each parent, that form a diploid zygote. That's, you know, easy high school bio work, right? But unfortunately, uniparental diastomy is an example of how the reality is a little more complicated than high school bio. So enough pre-work, let's talk about the real work. What is uniparental diastomy? It involves offspring with both chromosomes in a pair originating from only one pair. So unlike, unlike sorry, Mendelian genetics, you're not getting one from each parent, both are just coming from one parent. Another way of looking at it is this pedigree, right? Red and blue, these are the colors corresponding to each parent. The uh, offspring is, is only going to get, you know, this blue pair that's coming from one of the parents rather than red and blue, one from each of the parents. This, okay, that's the basics, but to me, it sort of begs two questions. One, how does this happen? Two, why does this matter? Good questions. Let's start with the first. The key event that drives um, dysony, and there are technically many possibilities, but this is the most likely and most occurrent is non-disjunction. And you probably heard this in terms of mitosis, right? When these chromosomes are supposed to align on the metaphase plate, they don't separate correctly, and you create these daughter nuclei with uh, too many copies, too many chromosomes. That is sort of mitotic non-disjunction. But there's no reason why it can't also happen in meiosis. And in fact, it does happen in meiosis. These non-disjunction events do occur in meiosis. I want you to brace yourself. We're moving from these professional graphics to Ethan graphics, which are about 7,000% worse. So here we go. Let's talk about meiotic disjunctions. First place where non-disjunction can occur in meiosis is meiosis 1. So in meiosis 1, homologous chromosomes line up, supposed to separate, but they also could not separate. They could fail to separate. And that failure eventually leads to these gametes that have one of each homologous chromosome. Or technically, the way I like to think about it is one sister chromatid from each pair of homologous chromosomes. Again, probably unnecessarily complicated. The colors show it well, but that's just how I think about it. But you can't only fail. Well, it's not only possible to fail at meiosis one. You could also fail at meiosis two. The homologous chromosomes separate correctly. You could also fail at separate sister chromatids. That creates a gamete with two identical sister chromatids. So the eventual gametes that are created from these events are shown here. You get the two sister chromatids or the homologous chromosomes. And during fertilization, you now have to introduce a sister chromatid from the other parent. So what do you get from this addition? Well, you get two trisomies. In order to avoid a potentially lethal trisomy event, the, the, the cell, the zygote, ejects a chromosome. So again, I, I kept the colors here. They're a little complicated, but just to review, the red are the two identical chromatids. Blue and red are the homologous chromosomes. The purple is from the other parent. And I'm not certain. Again, I'm going to have to do more additional research. You might have to check the description of this video for additional clarification. But to my understanding, it's possible you reject one of these two or one of these two, but it's also possible you reject the one from the other parent. In the event that you reject the one from the other parent, you have yourselves a dysony, a uniparental dysony, right? Because both of the remaining chromosomes come from only one parent. However, I kept the colors here for a purpose in that uniparental, di uniparental dysonies don't always involve the exact same chromosomes, right? You could either get the sister chromatids that are identical or you get 
the homologous chromosomes, which are not perfectly identical. And this nuance is encapsulated in these two terms I want to introduce, which are isodisomy and heterodisomy. Isodisomy is involved with the identical sister chromatids, two red. Heterodisomy is involved with the red and the blue, right? They both have homologous chromosomes. So going back to this picture, I want to do a little quiz. My mouse will cooperate with me. Which one is heterodisomy? Which one is isodisomy? Pause this video. I'm going to un uncover in three, two, one. Yep, that's isodisomy, identical sister chromatids, and heterodisomy, not identical sister chromatids, but instead homologous chromosomes. I do want you to think of it mechanistically. You could just memorize that right off the bat, but if you sort of go back to the explanation I gave you about you know, how this occurred, you could also think of this is as well, an isodisomy is a resolved myelitis 2 non-disjunction, right? Because myelitis 2 non-disjunctions involve a failure to separate sister chromatids, so you create gametes with both sister chromatids present, and sort of the same concept applies for heterodisomy, right? It's a resolved myelitis 1 non-disjunction. You create gametes that have both homologous chromosomes inside. Fertilization occurs creating a trisomy. You kick out the chromosome from the other parent, creating a heterodisomy where you have two of these homologous chromosomes that are there only because there was a non-disjunction in meiosis one. So sort of taking a step back and thinking about the whole karyotype here, thinking about how there's, you know, there's 23 chromosome pairs, many meiotic divisions have to occur in all the organisms that that reproduce through sexual reproduction, you have to imagine that even though this disomy event seems unlikely because it requires you know, all these events to occur in succession, if you think about it, even unlikely events are likely to occur if you do if you roll the dice enough times, right? With enough myonic divisions, with enough chromosomes having to separate, eventually one of them's not gonna separate correctly. Eventually you're going to kick out the chromosome from the other parent and you get yourself a unique parental dice. So that is the how in a nutshell. But that still leaves the other question at play, right? Because you might be thinking in your head, or at least I was at this point, okay, that's how it works. That's a lot of complex ideas, but why does this matter? Does this just mean that I'm a little more like one of my parents? So instead of getting both, you know, a mix, I am more like one of my parents. Boo hoo, who cares? That's a fair point. But in order to figure out why it matters, I want you to think about genetic disorders. Let's think about this pedigree, this, this pedigree. Let's say we're talking about an autosomal recessive disorder. You have two unaffected parents and you have an affected um, child. And if you look at the genotypes of the parents at this specific gene locus, you have a homozygous dominant and a heterozygous and creating a um, offspring, a child that is homozygous recessive. This should immediately ring alarm bells for you. This shouldn't happen in basic Mendelian inheritance patterns, right? Because if you look at the Punnett square, heterozygous, homozygous dominant, blah, 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 homozygous dominant, there is no homozygous recessive here. This should not happen. And if I caveat to you that this is the true genotypes of both parents, and they, these are truly the parents of the offspring, how could this happen? Well, one thing that came to my mind, right, is de novo mutation. What is a de novo mutation? It's just a random mutation that occurs in an individual that is not inherited from their parents. This is just something that just happened spontaneously, and an error perhaps in the many steps of replication that have to occur. If in, in every organism, right? Um, this could just be a de novo mutation. This could be something of chance, and that would be fair. However, what if I told you that scientists even sequence did whole genome sequencing for the parents, both parents and the child, using my fancy machines here. Actually, it doesn't look too fancy. Oh, I'm the computer there. But let's say that was a newer computer. I did whole genome sequencing on it, and I told you that, wow, there's an interesting observation here. Um, the child's chromosomes that hold this specific gene and allele in question, where they are homozygous recessive for, they're exactly the same chromosomes present in the mother. They're exactly the same as one of the, as one of the chromosomes present in the mother. And that sort of opens the door for us to think about unique parental dicing, because a de novo mutation would explain one mutation at the specific locus that causes the disorder. But if you're telling me the entire chromosomes, specific chromosome of this child is identical to one of the parents' chromosomes, both copies are equivalent to one of the parents' chromosomes, that implicates uniparental dicing, right? Looking at this pedigree, what if they only inherited this small A chromosome or the chromosome where this small A sits at? How would this happen? Let's review, thinking about the mechanism of this. 
Well, you could have a meiosis two non-disjunction. If we pretend this is the copy of the one chromosome that has the recessive allele for this genetic disorder, if we had a meiosis two non-disjunction, you're going to create a gamete that has two identical sister chromatids, both with a recessive allele. And then if you assume that the sort of ejection of the paternal dominant allele on the chromosome occurs, ignoring this one, you will create an offspring that is homozygous recessive at this specific locus. So this specifically is an isodisomy that leads to the inheritance of an autosomal recessive disorder, even though the parents are heterozygous and homozygous dominant for this autosomal recessive disorder. I know you might be thinking, though, Ethan, you just blocked off heterodisomy. Does that mean only isodisomy can be deleterious? The answer is no, right? Isodisomy can cause inheritance of autosomal recessive disorders, but heterodisomy is also concerning as well. Going back to heterodisomy, right, you would think, well, these are homologous chromosomes, meaning that if the parent that these came from was heterozygous for this condition, then, well, one was going to be dominant, only recessive the offspring will not inherit an autosomal recessive disorder. And you would be right to presume that, right? Heterodiasomy doesn't have the same issues when it comes to, you know, potentially inheriting two copies of a parent's single copy of a recessive allele. But the issue that arises is a product of genomic imprinting. What is genomic imprinting? It's a constant idea that involves the fact that for certain genes, only one of the two copies of that gene in an offspring are active. And the reason, the, the rationale behind which one is active depends on the gene copies parent of origin due to parent-specific methylation. So recall, in basic Mendelian inheritance, which applies to a lot of our genes, right, a lot of our chromosomes, we get one copy from both of our parents, right, one allele from both of our parents. In this genomic imprint situation, only one of those copies is active, depending on the parent of origin, due to this sort of epigenetic mechanism which is methylation that occurs during gametogenesis of each respective parent. Gosh, I know, that's a lot of words. Let's see some poorly drawn pictures to try to elucidate this a little bit better. But let's say this is a zygote. And this is a sort of chromosome in question. One chromosome coming from parent one, one chromosome coming from parent two. Given that the pairs of two has a different biological sex than parent one, the parent two have, you know, sex-specific methylation of this chromosome. So in the gonads, in the ovaries, testes, regardless, whatever, of in the reproductive organs of each of the parents, epigenetic marks are taken away, right? Because remember, they're going to inherit their marks from their parents. So in the gonads of this specific individual, meaning this zygote's parents, you will erase those marks and place marks of their own. And the marks they place are based on that parent's biological sex. So that creates a situation where a zygote will inherit, you know, one copy from one parent, the other copy, the other copy from the other parent. This methylation will silence, you know, this specific gene, but that methylation will not be present on that gene. And therefore, you know, it will be okay. It will be a okay for that um, offspring because they have the right amount of gene copies. In this case, only one active gene. But let's say we have a hetero diastomy situation where homologous chromosomes from only one parent are inherited. Yes, while it does not mean that you're at risk for inheritance of autosomal recessive disorders from a heterozygous parent, you do risk having sort of double methylation at these gene loci. Because if you think about it, the methylation, the epigenetic marker addition that occurs during gametogenesis is sort of agnostic when it comes to alleles. It's just adding where it needs to add, regardless of what that specific sequence is. And the only thing that constrains whether or not the methyl is added is the biological sex of the parent. So given that these two chromosomes originated from one parent, which has their specific biological sex, then these methyl groups will be placed on both of these chromosomes at both of these identical loci, regardless of the fact that these technically might have difference in sequence because they are homologous chromosomes and not sister chromatids. And how does this happen? Well, again, just as a review, again, failure in meiosis one, right? Creating this sort of gang, which then fertilization happens, kick off the other parents' um, addition, right, during fertilization. But going back to this, the key is, is that now you have sil double silencing of this current, if this gene copy, right? That needs, that 
should have at least one active. That is a problem, right? Because it's originated from only one parent, that means that you're going to get only one type of epigenetic marking, not the other type from the other parent. And that means that you may have over silencing or over enhancing of specific imprinted genes. And that's a little bit complicated. So maybe, I don't know, rewind if it makes it a little clearer. But if I want to sort of distill this in a nutshell, the idea is that for some genes, you only have one active copy. And the reason why the active copy exists is because one copy you get from your from your mother or your father, the from your female parent or your male parent is silenced. So if you happen to only get chromosomes from one of your parents, then you won't get the sort of half and half. You won't get one active, one silenced. You might get both silenced or both active, which both could be an issue as a result of heterodicy. So as a review of everything we talked about today, what did we cover? Uniparental dicement. It involves offspring who acquire two copies of a chromosome from the same parent. It's generally a result of meiotic non-disjunction. Isodicemy involves inheritance of identical chromatids. Heterodicemy involves inheritance of homologous chromosomes. And heterodicemy leads to additional risk of imprinting issues in offspring, while isodicemy leads to additional risk of both imprinting issues and inheritance of recessive disorder. So I want to add that towards the end, right? We talked about isodicemy only in relation to these inheritance of recessive disorders, but you could also have the same issues as you did in heterodicemia, right? Because you still have two identical sister chromatids that only come from one parent, so that sex-specific, biological sex-specific imprinting that occurs during gametogenesis in that parent is going to happen on both of those sister chromatids, meaning that, that the offspring will also get the same identical sets of methylation instead of different methylation on each copy to allow for only one gene to be active and one to be silenced. Yeah, apologies if that's a little bit confusing, but maybe rewind that earlier explanation about how exactly that silencing occurs. Regardless, I hope this was at least slightly clear. I know I definitely could have been more clear. Hopefully the next the next video on this channel is a little more clear. I'm still working at the kinks of how these actually are going to work. I think as my teaching skills improve and as my comfort with this medium improves, I'll get better. But hopefully this was at least a little bit um, educational and a little bit maybe even entertaining, but probably not. Probably not the latter. And question whether the first is true as well. So these are uh, sort of the sports side and reference. I appreciate you watching. If you're staying with me at the end, regardless if you didn't, thanks for also watching too. Wish you all the best. Take care. Bye-bye.